11 Masters and Slaves In the South in the first half of the 19th century, an elite group of whites dominated the society and made profits on the labors of black slaves, who nonetheless were able to develop a rich culture of their own. The Divided Society of the Old South Slavery's existence in the Old South rested upon inequality. Socially, people living within the realm of a slaved base economy were granted status according to class and caste. Within the system, a diverse spectrum existed between planters and field hands. The World of Southern Blacks Slaves struggling against tremendous odds managed to create a full, rich culture. Moreover, slaves created a community that made psychic survival possible. Slaves' Daily Life and Labor 90% of the South's 4 million slaves worked on plantations, with the rest working in industry or in cities. Slaves working on plantations typically worked in a gang system, overseen by a driver. Some slaves who worked on the rice plantations worked under a task system that gave slaves more control over their workspace. Within both of these systems, about three-quarters of the slaves worked as field hands. The remaining slaves carried out a wide range of duties from cooking to cleaning to building and gardening. Slave Families and Kinship and Community The slave family was the most important institution of African Americans. Families, though often broken up, provided a foundation that prevented slaves from becoming completely demoralized. Most importantly, families provided slaves with a sense of community, not simply victimized individuals of oppression. African-American Religion A distinctive African-American religion shaped by evangelical Protestantism and African religion became the cornerstone for African-American culture. Themes of deliverance and freedom took priority. Religion further facilitated a sense of community, solidarity, and self-esteem for slaves. Resistance and Rebellion on a daily basis, African American slaves resisted their oppressive plight through sabotage, stealing, stealing of provisions, storytelling, and running away. Slaves also rebelled violently. Between 1800 and 1831, slaves participated in revolts, hoping to liberate themselves. Free Blacks in the South Though certainly a minority, a few blacks did attempt to live freely within the Old South. By the 1830s, this unique group became increasingly subjected to a rigid rules designed to limit their movement and contact with other African Americans. White Society in the Antebellum South Popular preconceptions of the antebellum South that portray the era with aristocratic splendor fall short of the reality for an overwhelming majority of white Southerners. Only about 1% of white Southerners could afford to own 50 slaves, entertain lavishly, and live in a mansion. Most white Southerners were non-slaveholding yeoman farmers. Nonetheless, their whiteness granted them economic, political, and social advantages. The Planter's World A tone and value of life in the South were determined by the big planters. Those who owned more than 20 slaves, even though they were a small minority, about 1% of the total white population. These men, typically self-made, earned considerable fortunes in commerce, land speculation, or slave trading, which they later increased by cotton planting. They carried over into the management of their plantations the same shrewd business sense that had given them their start. 
it was only the richest and the most secure planters who imitated the romantic ideals usually associated with their class. Planters and Paternalism Planters own more than half of all the slaves. Within this class emerged the ideology of paternalism. Planters believed that slaves were an extended part of their family that they cared for and protected. Planters also thought this was necessary because blacks were a race of perpetual children needing care. Other historians portray planters simply as brutal capitalists, only concerned with profit. But theories reveal a highly complex system that had to maintain itself through force, and also had to make a profit through maintaining healthy slaves. Nonetheless, testimony and evidence indicates that masters generally did not have close familiar relationships with their slaves. Small slaveholders. Eighty-eight percent of all slaveholders own fewer than twenty-five slaves. Most of these possessed fewer than ten. These households necessitated more intimate contact, though not necessarily better treatment. Scant evidence exists from those households. Yeoman farmer. Below the small slaveholders, mostly concentrated in the back country, lived the yeoman farmers who owned land they worked themselves. These folk were self-reliant and limited avenues to the national and global economics economies. Yeoman women played a vital role in maintaining household economies. A close mind and close society. The dominant planter class feared not only slave rebellion, but that the white small farmer might join the abolitionist crusades. The planters therefore created a mood of implementing disaster in order to encourage all Southerners to close ranks. After the, 18, after the 1830s, it became dangerous in the South even to speak of slavery as a necessary evil. Slavery could be described only as a positive good. This position was defended on the basis that Africans were inferior in some way, that slavery was sanctioned in the Old and New Testament, and that slavery provided a kind of human asylum for African Americans who would improve as a race because of slavery. In addition, Southerners claimed that slavery was superior to the northern wage-labor system. Although books criticizing slavery were censored and people who criticized slavery were beaten and forced to immigrate and efforts were made to keep slaves illiterate and to keep free blacks under surveillance, Southern planters never achieved a sense of security. By the 1850s, they began to believe that their safety could only be guaranteed by secession from the United States. Slavery and the Southern Economy Southern societies resisted economically upon the institution of slavery. Between 1810 and 1860, the number of slaves owned tripled, increasing the number to nearly four million. The Internal Slave Trade As tobacco farming became less important in some upper southern states like Virginia, Maryland, and Kentucky, which raised other crops and began infant industries, these states began selling surplus slaves to the Lower South. Slavery emerged to dominate the Lower South more than in the Upper South. The Rise of Cotton Kingdom the invention of the cotton gym and the introduction of short staple cotton to the lower south made cotton the single most important export and the most profitable business in the United States. The amount of cotton that was grown in the deep south grew dramatically between 1817 and 18. 